Cordelia is adhering, must be adhering to some kind of faith in what she does. You, you do not sacrifice your inheritance and yourself and your good name and your standing with your father unless you believe in something, you know, deep and true and, and you know, greater than uh, what you stand to gain in the incident. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Hello and welcome to this episode of Classical Etc. Today I sat down with Kyle Yonke and we talked about King Lear. We talked about how we both enjoy this play immensely, and we talked about the two themes that it illustrates, the nature of freedom and the power of fiction. We decided to do something unique on Classical Etc. because Kyle and I were having so much fun talking about King Lear, we decided to break it into two parts. If you want to guarantee that you'll see the second part, you can follow this podcast or you can subscribe to this channel. If you like this episode, then you can feel free to like it, or you can drop us a comment in the comment section. Now, here's our conversation. The King Lear episode. The King. <laughs> yeah. This is exciting. Mm-hmm. I think for you on a personal level, this might be your peak. I, You're an impressive man too, so that's not to take anything away. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So to, to talk about classical education in Shakespeare, they often go hand in hand, but I think it's helpful to articulate why that is. Mm-hmm. And for me, there, I have a, a very particular vision of why Shakespeare and classical education ought to be always in the same conversation. And I think one way you could talk about classical education and the project of classical education is the project of equipping students to enjoy what's good, true, and beautiful throughout their life, to give them mm-hmm. the tools to access the good life. And your joy is not complete without the bard, mm-hmm. would be my argument. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So this conversation, as we talk about King Lear, you've said it's your favorite play? Uh, yes. Yeah. To, to teach, I think it's my favorite play. Yeah. When we talk about it, one of the things that we, you know, just in conversation, when we bump into each other during the summer, when we, you know, we just like talk about the ways we enjoy this book and Mm -hmm. it's like a really fun conversation every time. So that's what this conversation will be is talking about how we enjoy it. And I think by extension, that gives people on ramps onto a text that is difficult. When someone Mm -hmm. tells me, when my high school students tell me they like Shakespeare, Mm-hmm. I think they're dishonest. <laughs> a lot of times not <laughs> yeah. on purpose probably, but Shakespeare's text is difficult and to actually enjoy it takes a lot of work. Um, and it takes some imagin- imagination and it takes some experience. I, mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy him until people who were older and wiser than me yeah. gave me eyes to see things that I had never been able to see before. Um, yeah. So that's what this conversation is. Yeah. And I've really enjoyed digging into King Lear this last couple of weeks. Um, Tell me about your that's great your yeah. relationship to this text. No, yeah, I, I mean, I had the, I yeah, I never, I was never a big Shakespeare fan in high school. I didn't have, um, I had fine teachers, but I didn't have, you know, a, I wouldn't say great Shakespeare teachers. And I had this crazy yeah. idea that I was going to be, you know, everybody's into Shakespeare, so I'm going to be into something, you know, unique and clever. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's a maturity I think that comes along with just recognizing. This is greatness. You mentioned goodness, truth, and beauty. But um, I think particularly uh, King Lear, the reason it's my favorite play to teach, and I don't I don't know that it's my favorite play um, overall. It's, it's up there, you know, top three. Um, <clears throat> but my favorite play to teach, it's, it's just perfectly crafted. It fits perfectly into a particularly, I would say, American classical um, classroom. It just the themes that it touches on, the the things that it deals with, um, are tailor made uh, to to match the considerations of being, particularly I should say, upper level um, high school classroom. Um, they're tailor made to just to match with the considerations of being an American citizen hmm. and graduating with with you know a sense of of what that means, which is funny for an English play. Um, but it works. Uh, and then also just as a literature teacher, this play also has just the clearest defense of um, the necessity of a student having a literary ability, that, mm. that it's, it's a non-negotiable, that this play makes clear you need to know something about literature and to be able to think that way, yeah. um, think imaginatively. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like, I love that those two themes, you know, it, I can see, you know, in hearing you talk about them, your years of just 
thinking about this play over and over again, year after year, tossing it around with students and boiling it down to two ways that this book can just kind of be an arrow mm. right to the situation that your students are in. And I think mm. a big piece of that is you're having been exposed to it for so long. And that's a, that's a big passion for me with Shakespeare yeah. is trying to, when I'm talking to friends who haven't been able to get into it um, or people who haven't had the same, like just fun experience with it that I, yeah. I've had, I, I'm very passionate about trying to share with them like there's a level of familiarity mm-hmm. and experience you have to have with this text before it starts to open up. So have like perseverance. Um, most yeah. of my students, I'm telling them, every book or movie that you watch or read in other arenas, you enjoy it after the first watch or two thirds through, you've decided whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. And that just doesn't work here. No. Yeah. Um, and over the last you know two weeks, as I've gone even further into this play again, you know, as preparing for this. Mm-hmm. After I had kind of gained that familiarity, then I went back and I've been watching Ian Holm plays King Lear. He was the mm. Bilbo in the Fellowship of the Ring, yeah. you know, uh-huh. recent. Ian McKellen played uh, played King Lear. Lawrence Olivier played Court King Lear. Anthony Hopkins played mm. King Lear. I've watched each of them do that act one, scene one. And mm. because I know where this is going, I know the plot, I know some of the the script when you're watching them, you're seeing them make all these decisions about how am I going to convey who this king is? How am I going to convey the fatal flaw? How am I going to, how am I going to establish the trajectory of this tragedy in the decisions? And you can't process those decisions, understand what they're doing, understand how that connects to their interpretation of the human condition without a certain level of familiarity. Um, And that I think is so important. So what we're going to do in this conversation is we're going to walk through the play kind of like we did with Sir Gawain. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I just want to hear kind of your thoughts and talk about the different things that are enjoyable about the various portions of the play. And so even someone who right. isn't very familiar with King Lear can mm-hmm. follow along, but if you're very okay. familiar, you get to enjoy it all over again. Yeah. Excellent. That sounds great. So the story of King Lear is a double story. Both of them are the same story. It's about men's with men with old white beards. Um, <laughs> And their yes. kids and their kid problems. Um, yeah. But there's two of them. So King Lear has three daughters. The play opens up with King Lear and his three daughters. And he says, whoever loves me the most, I'll give you the most land. Two daughters flatter him, tell him whatever he wants to hear. The mm-hmm. third one refuses to do it. And he says, nothing's going to come out of nothing. She gets nothing. The other two daughters, they get everything. Um, and that begins the tension. His most beloved daughter won't give him what he wants. And that's the tension of that plot goes from there. The other plot follows the Earl of Gloucester and his two sons. One is illegitimate, Edmund, and the other one, his legitimate son, Edgar. And the illegitimate son hates his brother. And so he deceives his father and his brother, and they begin to fight against each other. Well, they actually run from each other because of the threat of fighting against each other. And so you have these two conflicts that start. Um, So what do you think about his setup here? And what are the things that grab your attention as you get into King Lear? Yeah, so... Yeah. Um, so let me say to begin, my initial impression of reading King Lear for, for the longest time, um, there's a climactic scene. Everybody knows the, the famous scene of, of Lear and the Thunderstorm, which I'm sure mm-hmm. we'll get there. Um, but I remember reading it for the first time and thinking it, just that scene being completely inexplicable to me. Why mm-hmm. is he, what's he doing? Yeah. What, what's I, like just not understanding what is upsetting him. Hmm. Right. Enough to go out and the, shake his fist at heaven in, in the middle of a thunderstorm. So I think like my passion teaching with students is to get them to see, to get that scene to make perfect sense where they see, of, of course, he's feeling what he's feeling and not, not that's necessarily right, but they understand the feeling behind it. Um, and I think that begins all the way back in, in act one, scene one, right at the beginning of the play. Um, because Shakespeare does, they, we do to have these two parallel plots. Shakespeare introduces the King Lear one first. That's the the main plot, uh, and this is something Shakespeare will often do in other plays as well, where he'll have a parallel, you know, another plot going on that is informing us on how to read, um, how to come to some conclusion on the uh, the initial plot that's introduced. So, with the initial plot, with the introduction to King Lear, I think it's really important to look at uh, his motivations and what why his stated reason for why he's dividing his kingdom at all. 
Um, and it is, he, he wants to, uh, I think the line is to, to unburden to crawl towards death. Mm-hmm. Right. And he's saying this, you know, tongue in cheek, he's not despairing and dying. I think he, he's saying this, you know, like I'm old, I'm on my way to die, um, or, you know, crawling towards death. And I'd like to do that unburdened of the, the responsibility and the, and the pressure to rule. But so I'm going to divide up my kingdom and my method for doing that is going to be to test um, who loves me most, which really turns into a question of who can pay the most honor to, to my dignity as king. So if you look at those, those two pieces of information that, that he wants to crawl towards death unburdened, but he wants to still be honored as a king. And he's going to um, allot you know, the land, the inheritance to his, to his children according to how they honor him as a king, how they honor his sovereignty, um, you get a really interesting picture of a, of a king who wants to be celebrated as a king, but who doesn't want to carry the responsibility mm-hmm. anymore. He, he just wants the honor. Yeah. He wants the dignity. Um, and it immediately it introduces an interesting question of human dignity, that, that where, where is that line? Um, I like to, to say it in terms of personal sovereignty, mm-hmm. that sovereignty over one's person, sovereignty over, you know, how others look at them and think of them and treat them. Um, where is that line for a human being between, you know, how far does our dignity extend? How far does our personal sovereignty extend? Uh, which is also really a question of, of liberty. And, and that's what I mean when I say it, it, it matters so much to American high school students. It's like, what's the limit of that liberty, mm. of that of the sovereignty that you will have as an American citizen when you graduate from high school? Um, <clears throat> you know, what what exactly does that entail? What are yeah. its boundaries? Yeah. yeah. I have two thoughts on this that are interesting. So I think your question about what is causing him to get to the point of the storm mm. is a really interesting question because if you look at Aristotle's classic genre of tragedy, you mm. have fatal flaw and then peripatia, his movement in change of fortune. And people would say the classic example of change of fortune is him going into the storm. But your point mm. is is more important. And that is, that's the form. But what is the, who is the character? Mm-hmm. Yes, Shakespeare is following this form, but he's not following it for the form's sake. He's following yeah. it to give to to give us something about who this character is, and the more important question is what is the flaw, yeah. and that's what that's what drives him. Um, and the second point, and do you agree with that? that? I do. Yeah, yeah. It's it's more of a what is driving him. I mean, Lear, Lear goes mad. That's what he's doing in the thunderstorm. Yeah. But that's not an explanation. That yeah. why does he go mad? What right. drives him mad? Yeah. The other, the other point that's interesting that I think is important for students is remembering that this text, it is a play. Um, mm-hmm. And setting up the character to introduce that, that it's not just a form that they move through from fatal flaw to, to change of fortune. Directors have a really interesting decision to make. Actors have an interesting decision to make to show how they're going to convey Lear, especially that line that you mentioned, unburdened yeah. crawl to, to earth. I was struck by the 1983 Lawrence Olivier version that – he comes in extremely regally and there's this like the trumpets blow. And then when they come in, all of the actors lie down flat on their faces <laughs> and get yeah. back up because they're, they're trying to give something to the crown. They're through yeah. that choice. They communicate something um, that sets up Lear uniquely. Mm-hmm. Um, one other thing in act one, before we move on um, <clears throat> back to that question of, of the boundaries of dignity and, 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 you know, uh, uh, personal liberty and personal sovereignty. So that that question of wh- where does true dignity lie, um, that being an American question and, and holding that in mind, um, it, it's also an English question, of course. Yeah. Um, I mean, our, our heritage. It's a human is, question. Yeah, it's a human question. Our, our heritage is, you know, in, in inherited from mm-hmm. from England. But um, uh, yeah, so, so that where does that that true dignity lie? I mean, I see that you know, um, you know we hold these truths to be self evident. A lot of what this play is doing, it, it's the self-evident part sure. of, of those truths. Like you can read this play and see that they are self-evident. And I think in order to accomplish that, Shakespeare sets up a fascinating contrast uh, of characters between uh, Cordelia 
a character who who I think even after the opening scene you absolutely love. So she's the most loved daughter of Lear who doesn't yes. flatter him. Yes, who doesn't flatter, which which is um, sort of inherently satisfying, mm-hmm. right? When we can tell someone is flattering and lying, and then we have a truth teller. You know, we're on the side of the truth teller, yeah. um, and she gets banished for it. It, it doesn't go well for her. Um, which makes us sort of inherently mad at Lear. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so so we have that character set up and we love her. And, and immediately in scene two, uh, that is when Shakespeare chooses to introduce us to Edmund, mm-hmm. who will become the arch villain of the play. Um, and he, this is also an introduction to the second plot, the parallel plot um, with the Earl of Gloucester and mm-hmm. his two sons. Um, and... Edmund opens that scene with with his you know his famous soliloquy, "Thou nature art my goddess," mm-hmm. and I think it's it's important and and just uh, fruitful in a reading of the play to to contrast his argument in that speech and his approach to living life to contrast that with Cordelia's. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, that speech uh, his soliloquy ends with "I grow, I prosper." Cordelia has done the opposite. Cordelia has failed to prosper, yeah. seemingly. Yeah. She's been cast into banishment. Um, and I think Edgar's, I'm sorry, Edmund's, uh, Edmund's main point in that speech, the reason nature is his goddess, he goes on later to, to speak of the excellent foppery of the world where men blame the stars and they blame fate for their wrong actions. Mm-hmm. And he sees it as, that's just us. It's just our actions, right? And in this world that he lives in, there's nothing beyond man. Mm. There, there, there's nothing but nature. Nature yeah. is my goddess. And nature is an arena. Um, he, he identifies her, you know, nature as, as a, a sort of lawless arena in which it's, it's you know, the, the, uh, the fittest survive, mm. right? Um, which is quite an opposite. Cordelia is adhering, must be adhering to some kind of faith sure. in what she does. You, you do not sacrifice your inheritance and yourself and your good name and your standing with your father um, unless you believe in something, you know, deep and true and, and you know, greater than uh, what you stand to gain in the incident. And that's that's exactly what Edmund is denying yeah. in his speech, that there is any such thing. And so Shakespeare gets those two things rolling in the play, that, that on the one hand, you've got this idea that there's something greater out there that's yeah. worth sacrificing everything you have for. And on the other hand, there's... You get what you can while you can and when you can because, because that's all there is. And it's it's a vision of this this perfect kind of uh liberty. Like Edmund Edmund is the most free. And what's what's scary too is that he seems to have some um at least on the surface, some insight into the world. You know, he sees things more deeply than other characters. Mm-hmm. He's looking through all of the flattery and you know, we could say we could say it this way, Edmund is entirely unflattered. Hmm. Um, which makes him stronger and more dangerous even than Lear. Yeah, in that famous speech, he's so angry that being illegitimate means anything. Like, why should that yes. control his actions? And that, there's there's an insight there. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, we, we could connect this this to uh, to, to two quotes uh, that kind of sum up the characters. I think Cordelia um, has her line to her sisters before she goes into banishment. Uh, time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides. Mm. And it, I mean, really? Is that true? Is that going to happen? Are, are you certain that that's going to happen? That that this will all be worked out um, in the end? Mm-hmm. Versus Edmund, who says, you know, he, he ends the scene, scene two, um, with all is meet with me that I can fashion fit. Mm. Which basically, you know, everything's fine with me as long as I can shape it and control it and make it make it work, yeah. which again is that perfect, his sovereignty extends as far as he can push it, as far as he can take it. Um, whereas Cordelia goes willingly into this, uh, well, into banishment. You know, she's, um, uh, Edmund might call her a slave to her uh, to her virtue. Yeah. Yeah. So before we go into the next act, which mm-hmm. is the storm, um, because Lear finds out that his daughters have actually tricked him, the flattery is not genuine, he begins to crack. He's he's mm-hmm. going crazy. He gets driven into the storm. There's one one note I wanted to mention that I think is a part of accessing the the enjoyment that is Shakespeare, 
Mm-hmm. And that is entering what you could call the, you know, Shakespeare extended universe. And that mm-hmm. is all the different things that crop up in his plays in different ways. And what you were talking about there, the dichotomy of nature and fortune, which is obviously two mm-hmm. ideas that are in the the thought world of people of his day, but he yep. uses them in such a specific way. Yeah. But there are other examples. And one that I found in King Lear that I think is really interesting is just the metaphor of a snail with his house. Yes. So. Yeah. And as you like it, the same exact image comes up when Rosalind, the female mm-hmm. protagonist, is talking to Orlando, who loves her, he, and she's disguised. She's trying to test if he really loves her. And he says, I would rather be you know, courting a snail who keeps mm-hmm. his house on his back because then I would know mm-hmm. he'd be faithful rather than you. Such an, oh, a kind of strange mm-hmm. image, but, but you get the idea. What kind of other creature carries around its domestic responsibilities on its back? Sure, yeah. Same exact line comes up out of the mouth of the fool with King Lear when he, King Lear is does, m- yeah. mourning his, his daughter's treatment of him and the fool says, you'd be better if you were a snail. And that contrast between a mm-hmm. king and a snail, but the concept of domesticity and the image of the snail, that, that kind of stuff is on every page of a Shakespeare play. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, um, oh, it's exciting to, to make those comparison between comparisons between plays. Mm. Um, and just to see what, what Shakespeare is doing overall and the consistency too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. With that line, the snail line in King Lear, I mean, that, 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 I mean, you mentioned carrying your domestic responsibilities on your back, like back to that responsibilities. That's exactly, and this is a fool's point. Um, that's exactly what Lear has cast off. Mm-hmm. Um, is his is his shell, and and the fool um, points out to him the fool who, I mean, I read him as he walks around as Lear's mirror yeah. through the whole play, just showing <laughs> showing him who he is, showing Lear who he is, um, until Lear finally comes to see. Um, but yeah, so, so that that you know, telling Lear, you know, the fool communicating this idea to Lear that you're a snail who's laid aside his house, yeah. which makes you vulnerable you, yeah. you know weak and small and vulnerable um and undignified yeah. i might add too so yeah and that's i mean that's that's uh we're you know we're one step closer with that idea to um to the thunderstorm that's coming thank you for joining me for this episode of classical etc if you want to show support for the video then you can hit the thumbs up icon below to give it a like or if you want to leave a comment you can tell me what conversations you'd like me to have in the future Check out our Memoria Press YouTube channel to find tons of other educational resources. And also a huge thank you to the Memoria Press Podcast Network. This is Classical Etc. and I'll see you next time.